welcome to this end of series special. Coming up, I'm going to check out some compilers. I set up my old PC and try out the Spectrum Classic CD. I also try some remix on the same machine. I try to rebuild my Data 5000 case. And after lockdown, Jeff and I visit the Arcade Club. And possibly more bits added on at the end. If you couldn't write machine code, your options were limited when it came to producing games. You could try to release a basic game, but that really was out of the question by late 1984. You could try one of the game creation tools, but they wouldn't let you save out games as standalone. You could try and learn machine code, hmm, or you could try a basic compiler. These promised to turn your basic games into machine code magically. Although from my very brief encounter with one in 1984, I felt a bit disappointed. Some games have been written and released using compilers, notably Slippery Sid from Silversoft and, remarkably, Frankenstein from PSS. In this experiment, we're going to put several compilers up against each other and see how they work. I have created a few simple tests and I'll run these in BASIC to get the timings and then try to compile each one and rerun the tests. As we move along, the BASIC code will get more complex. On to the compilers of choice then, First up is MCODE 2 from PSS, released in 1983, costing 995. Following that is Softec FP, or Floating Point Compiler from Softec, released in 1983, costing 1995. And then Softec IS, which is the integer compiler, released in 1983, again costing 1995. The HiSoft Colt Compiler, released by HiSoft in 1985, costing 1295. And finally, Zip Compiler, which was initially released by Your Spectrum Magazine. Now a quick note about the tests. The programs I'm going to use are not notable benchmarking routines. They're just a few things to try, the sort of things you might do when writing basic programs. The first is a very simple drawing routine that draws blank spaces down the screen, looping through each of the colours. Then there's a circle routine, which draws a few circles, again looping through the colours, and then there's a very simple block chase game. And finally, there's a type in from type in corner, which I doubt will compile. Most compilers require some changes to Sinclair Basic, and some are just not compatible with certain functions or commands. So I'm expecting quite a few errors. Let's start then. First of all, here's the basic code for the very first test. As you can see, very simple. Running this in Basic takes one minute and two seconds to complete. You don't have to sit through it all, so let's move on to the first compiler, MCODA2. Because this is the first time we're using it, I'll explain how it all works. Once loaded, you can then load your test code via tape. And once that's loaded, you enter randomised USR 60,000 to run the compiler. MCODA will then evaluate the basic listing and warn of any errors. You can then make any changes and try again. Here though, we had no errors, which was good and we can now execute the machine code running randomised USR 40,000. And the result is visibly faster. It now takes 11 seconds to complete, which is a big improvement. Let's try FP compiler. Now to use this, we first load the compiler and press any key to clear out the basic, and then load our test program and enter randomised USR 59300 to compile. and that worked fine. And we execute that with randomised USR 40,000 again, and the result is slower than encoder, but still faster than basic, running in at 24 seconds. The IS compiler. This works exactly like the FP compiler, and the start address is the same. But does it compile to faster code? Yes, it does. Twice as fast, running in at 9 seconds. That's faster than MCODER too. Onto HiSoft, and this operates just like the MCODER. You load the program, 
and to randomize USR 60,000. It compiles fine and running it with randomized USR 40,000. And this is about the same speed as encoder, running in at 12 seconds. And now onto zip. The compiler sits at line 5000 and beyond, so any basic program has to sit above that. This means you have to type them in, and you can't load them from tape because it'll overwrite the compiler code. It also takes ages to compile. Yes, we're still waiting. It goes through each line, checks for problems, and then goes through each line again to try and compile it. Nearly done now. No, this goes on forever. Luckily this was only a small program. Let's skip to the end result then. That was quite fast. In fact, that was very fast, taking just 7 seconds. The fastest so far. So at the minute, the score table looks like this. Now onto the circle routine. Here's the basic program, and it draws circles in different colours. The basic routine takes 31 seconds. Mcoder compiled without issues, but the resulting code took exactly the same time, 31 seconds. Both Softtech compilers worked fine and the resulting code again took 31 seconds, so there's no advantage here. Highsoft's compiler produced a 34 second routine, and the zip compiler failed because it doesn't support the circle command. Oh dear, that's not looking good, is it? Let's move on to something a little bit more complex, the block chase game. Here's the basic listing, and here is the game. You control the square and have to avoid the chasing X. Quite simple, but this introduces a few more things to consider, namely sound, movement and key inputs. Let's try encoder then, and that doesn't like beep commands that are decimal. But this can be overcome easily by changing them to fractions. Line 42 we change from 0.07 to 7 one hundredths, and try again. And this time it worked. How does it run then? Well, definitely faster. But the ghost subs didn't seem to work at the end, and the values of the start position are not reinitialized. Moving the three lines to set the variables at the top fixed that problem. And I think the game runs about 50% faster. On to FP compiler then. No errors here with compilation, which is good. And yes, it runs fine, and even the ghost subs worked. I think this is slightly slower than the encoder result though. Now, IS compiler. This had an issue with the beep command, and again we just changed it to a fraction, and now it compiles OK. But wow, that's fast. That's because the beep command doesn't seem to be working, and it crashes when you get caught. Changing this to a fraction did work, but it didn't take the same values. I had to use 1 30th to get a similar sound. Another issue is collision. Not sure why, but you can't get killed unless you move into the X itself, and then you get an error. On to Highsoft then. This also doesn't like beeps in decimal, so changed it to 7 one hundredths and it compiles fine. And it runs faster than basic, and the collisions work, and the ghost subs work. It's not a bad result, actually. Now, on to the zip compiler, and I had a brainwave. Instead of typing the program in, which I wasn't prepared to do, why not try and merge my test program? And yes, it seemed to work fine. That makes it much easier. But, oh no, the slow compile. Ugh. And errors already. It won't accept in keys. 
So really, without changing the entire program to use the in command, there's no hope of this working. I think we can leave zip out of this test and probably the next one as well. I know I could speed up the emulator to compile, but this is a real world test and how it would have been done back in the 80s. Right, onto the final test then, a typing program. Now this is a much larger beast, and it adds user-definable graphics as well, and many other things into the mix. This might be a bit ambitious, but this is exactly the sort of thing that you'd buy a compiler for. It's an Asteroids game called Rock Attack, as you can see, running here in pure basic. And if you're interested, this game is available to download from my site as it was part of Typing Corner. Let's start with Encoder first then, and straight away we get an error with the poke. This is the part of the program that creates the user-definable graphics. Now I've got two options here, I can rewrite the way the UDGs are created, or load a separate graphics file. User-definable graphics start at memory address 65368, and are 176 bytes long for the full set. So I save these out from the basic in the hope I could load them in and bypass the poke routines. Right, another error. Line 102, okay, change that, and now it works. Another error, line 175, hmm, this isn't going well, is it? Let's try something a little bit more simpler then. How about the rabbit run game that George used in the excellent articles in the magazine? No, nope, errors again, okay, let's go down to something even simpler. How about this comic game? This appeared as a proper type-in in my magazine. Here it is, really simple, but how does it compile? Uh, no, I had to change the beep again. And no, it doesn't like computed values by the look of it. Now this is getting slightly frustrating. For completeness, I'm going to try the Asteroids game on the other compilers, but I don't hold out much hope. First, FP compiler. Okay, it doesn't like computed go subs, so that's out of the question. Next, IS compiler. Change the beep. And nope, computed go subs get in the way again. Hmm. Okay, high soft compiler. It doesn't like the poke routine, so I swapped it out to load the UDGs in from a separate file, and now it complains about the beep. Hmm, nearly there. Another beep, change point one to one fifth. Ooh, it compiled. Let's try the game then. Ah, oh, invalid colour. Mm, okay, last chance then. Swap out the random colour. Uh, integer out of range. Okay, take out the plot routine altogether. And it compiles, yes. Will it run? Yes, it does. And here's a comparison side by side. I think you can see there's a big improvement in this. The game plays as it would expect, it takes key inputs, the sound's working, the graphics are working, all very well. Now this is the sort of thing you'd expect when you bought one of these things, but it does take a lot of messing about. Well I think it's time we stop now to be honest, but what conclusion should we come to? Compilers do not deliver what they promise. Unless you write your game from scratch, with the compiler you're going to use in mind, things are not going to go well. Highsoft Colt was the only compiler to compile the full type-in. Yes, it did need some modifications though, but still a good result where all the others failed. I think I'll go sit down in a dark room now. But if I do that, how would I load games onto my Spectrum? The answer is this device, the SVI CAS or SVI CAS. The unit was sent to me for review, and I must say it looks and feels very well built. Firstly though, what is it? This is a device designed out of frustration of not having a single unit that can load cassette images into various different microcomputers. This can be used with a wide range of micros including the ones listed on screen. And obviously it works with the spectrum. Now let's take a look around. The unit measures 75 by 100 by 25 millimeters. 
On one side is an SD card slot, and on the opposite side are connectors. There's one for the power, one for input, one for output, and in the case of the Spectrum this would be mic and ear sockets, and the other one is a connector for micros that allow control of the unit from the computer itself. You connect it to your Spectrum just like a normal tape player. The ear and mic sockets are plugged in, an SD card is inserted, preloaded with a few games that I put together, and finally the power. And once switched on, we get a fantastic looking display. This is a touchscreen, and all settings and functions are accessed using a stylus, or if you really want, your finger. Once set to the Spectrum, we can start using the unit. The display does look very crisp and very clear, and the screen design and images at the top are different depending on the micro you select. Let's go through the options then. Top left we have baud rate. This can be set to manual or automatic. Now some micros let you change the different speeds of loading, sadly not the Spectrum. Next is the edge detection, which lets you set the recording trigger needed for some computers. Next, the tape monitoring control, and here you can set this to automatic or manual, and this allows you to stop and start the tape manually, or let the device do it for you. Next is the timing, and you can set this to PAL or NTSC. And then the audio options allow you to turn on and off menu sounds, or turn on and off loading sounds. And lastly we have the waveform, and this lets you change the output signal. Now not all of these are needed for the Spectrum, but like I said in the introduction, this was designed to be used with a wide variety of micros. OK then, once it's connected, let's load a game. First we select the Files option and can view the SD card, including any folders. We use the arrow keys and go into the folder, and then you can see a list of games. You select the file you want, and it will display the contents of that file. When we are ready, we select the Play icon, and the unit supports TAP and TZX files. We then set the Spectrum to load as normal, and if you selected Auto Play, it will start on its own, otherwise you click the Play icon. And off we go! Because this is emulating and replacing your cassette player, it works at the same speed, so don't expect instant loading. During the loading we get a nice display that informs us of the remaining percentage left, and what's actually been loaded. I tested a few games, and they all worked perfectly. I tried Daily Thompson's Decathlon with that weird loader that caused so many problems back in the day. I tried Trantor with the impressive screen loader. I also tried Bobby Bearing. And not a problem for any of the games I tested. Obviously I didn't test every single game or variant of loading schemes, but I gave it a fair trial across different companies and years. Now on to saving data, and a cautionary note, my original attempts failed until I'd gone through the menu and changed the waveform and the edge detection, and then everything was fine. Right, when saving data, this can be used to save typing games, data from programs such as Taskword, saved games from adventures, and anything that you'd save on an original cassette player. First we create a blank tape, and to do this we navigate to the folder we want to use, we select the home screen, we then select the record option, and we are asked to enter a file name for that tape. We then select the record icon, and depending on whether we've set the unit to be manual or automatic, the recording will either wait for a signal to start loading, or wait for your input. Now we can see the recording screen, ready to start saving data. And again, this is done just like you did in the old days with your cassette player. You can pause recording, and save multiple files onto a tape. And clicking the stop, will close the tape off, ready for you to use. I tested this with Taskword, as well as a few basic listings, and a few adventure games, and everything worked as you'd expect. This is a solidly built device that will replace your aging cassette player and support many more machines. If you are a retro collector with a few different micros, then this could be a lifesaver, a single device that works with all your machines. For single system owners, like myself, the device works very well and it looks really nice. The screen is easy to read, and the added benefit of being able to save a tape is a real winner. 
If you're looking to get rid of your broken cassette player and want to load games in an authentic manner, then this is a great device to choose. For this video I need to get out my old Compaq Evo desktop PC, last seen on the show many years ago. I haven't used this since I moved house, so I have no idea if it survived or not. After checking the inside of the case to make sure things are still connected, plugging in the monitor and setting up a keyboard and mouse, I turned it on, and yes, no blue smoke. The usual BIOS issues were there, the clock not set, etc, and things were looking good. Yes, it still works. For reference, this machine is a Pentium P4, running at 2GHz with 1GB of RAM and a 40MB IDE hard drive, and it's running Windows XP. The reason why I need this machine is because of this, Sinclair Spectrum Classics CD by Revive. This was sold, well, I have no idea really, initially. There's no date on the packaging or disc, and the URL and the inner sleeve goes to a dodgy Japanese site. Inside is the disc and a small instruction sheet that indicates not only does it have a Spectrum emulator on it, but also a 64 emulator and an arcade emulator. That will be interesting to see how those work. And on the inside of the case are various instructions. According to these, we just insert the CD. Okay, here goes. Well, it reads it. Now let's get rid of this autoplay nonsense. Ah, a readme file. Emulatorsunlimited.co.uk Well, a quick search shows that that domain is no longer registered. But using the Wayback Engine, this CD, along with many others, were being sold from around 2001 to around 2004, for a price of £10. Over the time, the inlay changed, as did the website. They also sold other collections, like C64, Amiga and Amstrad, and they all look a bit dodgy to me. The disclaimer notes that the files had been downloaded from various FTP sites, so that would seem to indicate that there were no license deals here. In other words, this is not an official release. Let's get to that emulator then. The instructions say you go to a folder named WinSpec, and then into another folder called Binaries, and then double click the executable. Ah, oh, seems it can't find a DLL. Before I try and fix this though, let's have a quick browse of the disk and see what it contains. There are folders named Amiga System, DLL, Emulators, Games, Specy Emulators, Amiga, and WinSpec. In the DLL folder are a bunch of DLLs, including the one that we need to get it working, but we'll carry on for now. In the Emulators folder are many, many Spectrum emulators. A few for the Amiga, including ZXAM and ZX Spect, one for the Archimedes, a few for the Atari, a load in the IBM PC folder, including Z80, JPP, Warriavo and VGA spec, two QL emulators for Linux or Linux, an emulator for Macs, and another PC folder holds a ton of emulators for MS-DOS, including X128, various versions of Z80 and SpecMU. Now this caught my eye, a file called Jetpack. No, it's not the Spectrum game, it's a remake. I'll have to check that out later. There's a Spectrum emulator for the Scion, a few tools, some emulators for Unix, and in the Windows folder, a load more, including ZX32 and WSpecM. Now a word about these emulators. As they are so old, many of them are way out of date, and probably don't work on modern machines, so I'm not going to try them. I just want to see the emulator the disk is using, and try a few games, and of course, that Jetpack remake. A quick glance in the games folder shows that all the games are laid out in A to Z folders themselves, containing mainly SNA files. So quite a few to try out. In fact, as the inlay states, 3000 of them, all unlicensed. Right then, let's get this emulator working. Going into the WinSpec folder and ooh, a readme file. It says if you have problems to call a number in Swindon in the UK at a rate of one pound per minute. Blimey, they certainly know how to rip people off. So we know that this doesn't work and I tried registering the DLL and that failed. So eventually I copied the entire contents to the hard drive along with the DLL. Right, let's try again. Ah, now it loads. So what is this thing? It seems it's WSpecM, an emulator from around the same time as a CD was released. This is version 1.21 from 1996. And the last version on the website currently is 1.4B from 2002. The author admits it's a simplistic emulator, but says it's 100% CPU accurate. Right, let's check out a few features then. The file menu just has open, save, reload and exit. 
The option menu lets you enable and disable sound, flash and issue 3 emulation. You can change the screen size up to four times larger. You can change the speed. And if you've got a joystick plugged into your PC, you can say which format it's going to emulate. There's also a picture of the keyboard and that's it. The miscellaneous menu lets you pause, poke memory, reset or perform an NMI. Yes, it's quite simplistic. No options for a border, graphics changes like scan lines, no 1 to 8K emulation, no hardware emulation like Mac drives or Carr speech, no turbo tape loading, and no mention of tapes at all, but that's something to try out later. Right, let's load up again then. I immediately went for Jetpack first, obviously, but it's not there. Now a collection of games from 2000 or beyond should have Jetpack included, surely. Anyway, let's go and try Manic Miner then. Oh dear. This is slow, and the sound is terrible. It's using the internal PC speaker and not emulating the Spectrum sound at all. Let's try a smaller screen size. Nope, the game is terrible. And when you try and run the game, there are a lot of frame skips and the sound is just, well, dysfunctional. It's totally unplayable, really. Just for a comparison, I loaded up another emulator from the same disc, which runs Manic Miner much better, including the sound. I mean, it's not perfect, but compared to the previous one, it's miles better. OK, let's try something else. Invaders from Arctic Computing. Well, this is just about passable, I suppose. But the sound, again, no, it's just not working properly. Even adding speakers makes no difference. The emulator still uses the PC speaker. Let's try another game then, Exelon. Now this seems to run better, but still the sound is off. And finally, Aquaplane. Now I normally use this to test timings, but because this emulator doesn't emulate the border, we can't really test that. Again, the game seems to be running fine if a little slow, and the yes, the sound is still bad. At this point I thought maybe it was the PC, however the P4 was released after the CD, so it should be able to cope with it. Anyway, I got out the trusty Sony Vio laptop, and the emulator failed to run on the CD, so I had to copy it to the hard drive. For reference, this machine is a Pentium Celeron 2.8GHz processor with 512MB of RAM. Manic Miner first then, and oh dear. Seems that the emulator itself is not up to the job. I did try a tape file, and yes, they do load instantly, but that's no consolation really, if the game emulation is rubbish. Now it's time to stop this, I think. I tried to load the emulator on my Windows 10 machine to grab some better footage, but it just wouldn't run. Obviously, this emulator won't support multicolored games, and the CD wouldn't have had any on anyway. I do like playing old emulators on old hardware, it feels good but the emulator has to work properly. In the notes for this emulator, it claims that it's been optimised for 386 machines, so surely it should run properly on a P4. I suppose to round up then, this is a CD. Nope, I'll say it again, this is an illegal CD containing 3,000 unlicensed games and a bunch of emulators that are also unlicensed. But the emulator the disc highlights is terrible. It was of its time, and there were many other such CDs for people to buy that had no access to the internet, which was really in its infancy back then. For £10, it was a good deal, if you didn't know how to dig around on the internet to find the files you were looking for. Really though, now, it's just an archive of how things were in 2000. So that's it. A CD with lots of emulators and 3000 games. Now, what about that 64 emulator? Following the instructions on the CD, you go into the IBM PC folder, uh, no, nope, the emulator is just not there. Okay, what about the arcade emulator? Nope, that's not there either. So I can only assume that this card was provided with the other CDs they made, so they didn't have to print them out again. Oh well. 
probably for the best really. Now finally, on to the Jetpack remake. Let's give this a try. I had to copy it to the hard drive as well and whoa, whoa, whoa that's way too fast. Absolutely no chance of playing that. It seems to have been written to run as fast as possible, regardless of the processor, so now, with faster processors like the P4, it's just totally unplayable, and now I'm not going to set it up in DOSBox and start throttling things. So there you have it, a CD full of games and emulators that don't work on modern hardware. Oh well, at least I got it for much less than the original asking price. While I had the old PC set up, I thought I might go through a few old retro gamer DVDs and try out some specy remakes. In between filming the specy Classics CD and this, I replaced the hard drive with a compact flash adapter and replaced the motherboard battery. So let's get on. Remakes were a big thing back in the 90s and I wrote quite a few myself. Let's start with this DVD. It came with issue 7 of Retro Gamer magazine and it promised 50 games and videos of Spectrum End Games. But that's for another day. Let's give it a whirl then. The DVD boots with a nice menu and lists a lot of remakes. No need to go through the other discs just yet then. I have loads of these DVDs, so I may come back to those in a later episode. Some of these games look familiar, and yes, there are a lot of my games on there. Arcadia, Booty, Scumball. They did this without permission. I think they asked if they could use Booty, and I agreed, but it seems that they took that, that they could just rip my games off and put them on there. Let's pick out a few games then, starting with Aquarius, originally by Bugbite. Nice sound. The gameplay is almost identical, although there is no secret code given at the start, so I'm not sure how the game ends in this one. The sharks also home in on you on the spectrum when they turn around. Quite a nice game this! Let's move on to one of mine then, Arcadia, from 2002. Wow, that's so long ago now. <laughs> Obviously it's a version of the Imagine game, and it has all the levels, but with improved graphics and sound. The window seems quite small on modern computers, but it's still playable. Now a quick look at Booty, another one of mine, this time from 2003. It says so in the readme file. This game has the option to go into windowed mode, so you can stretch the screen if you need to. That MIDI music is a bit too loud though. Maybe a setting on this computer. It is a fresh install after all. The game has all the rooms of the original and plays exactly like the Spectrum version. And by the way, in case you're wondering, Booty, Arcadia and the rest of my games can be downloaded from my website. Let's have a look at this then, Hunchy. Obviously it's a Hunchback clone. Nice presentation with this. Really nice graphics. I really like how this looks. The keys are a bit awkward. You use the cursor keys to move and the up arrow to jump. A good version then, for the few differences, but an enjoyable little game nonetheless. And now on to Hungry Horus. Ooh, this one goes full screen. Okay, so it's Horus, with large coloured graphics and updated sounds.
It plays just like the Spectrum version. Controls are good, and if I liked the Horace games, I would have said this is a fair version. Enough of remakes. How about some Spectrum games? Let's take a look at a few new titles then. First up is Akane, released by Hicks in 2021. Here we have a nice platformer that reminds me much of the Chirira engine games, but the details say it has been written from scratch. You are a ninja out to rescue Rukin. And being a ninja, you have ninja skills. You can dash to avoid nasties and throw stars to kill them. There is a problem in that the land is poisoned and to survive long enough to complete your task, you have to keep drinking the potions that are found lying around the levels. As time moves on, your life, which is displayed at the bottom right, is slowly drained. And so the potions are required to keep you alive. That means there's a time limit, so you can't hang around on the levels. The graphics are nice, and it's an enjoyable game. I did find it a little difficult though. Next we have Travel Through Time Volume 1, The Northern Lights, released by Zosia Entertainment in 2021. Now this is a very impressive game. The story unfolds as you play, and starts off with a nice cutscene. Essentially it's a driving game. Notice I didn't say racing there. That's because if you go around driving recklessly, something nasty will happen sooner or later. The first section has no limits or race, it's just getting used to the car. As you travel around you meet people who expand the story. And there are plenty of levels, 60 in fact, although if you complete this 60, legend has it that there are more awaiting you. The levels vary from straight driving, to racing, or time trials. There are six different playable cars, cutscenes, and a lot of scenery. In fact the graphics are brilliant, very well done and silky smooth. The road signs actually represent what's coming up on the road, so you need to keep an eye out for them. And that's very important for the very first driving section. This is not a game that we'd rush into though. It's an experience, a story, and something to enjoy over many sessions. Once you get past the first level, avoiding the train, you will reach your next challenge. After a cutscene, where you're introduced to a character, the next stage begins, a time trial. Here you race against other cars, and you have a set time limit to complete the course. This is definitely one of the best modern games I've seen in a long time. It's really well presented, put together well, and great to play. Next we have Pitman, released by Under 4 MHz in 2021 again. Now this is a block sliding puzzle that really tests out your brain. You have to collect the diamonds on each level, and to do this you have to move the blocks. Some of the ground elements can also be removed by walking into them, and in between that and the ladders, you have to work out how to complete each screen. I must admit, it took me about 10 attempts to do the first screen, which is a bit embarrassing, but I kept on going. Nice simple graphics and character movement, but that plays an important part of this game, as you will find out. A good brain teaser then. 
and definitely want to have a go if you like this sort of game. And finally, we have The Doom of Pond, released by Furillo in 2021. Now we have something here rarely seen on the spectrum these days, a graphic adventure, and a good one at that. Anyone familiar with the LucasArts games will be at home with the controls. These are represented by a set of icons which depict any actions that you want to do. For example, examine, give, use, or move. play an unsavoury character, about to leave the village and take your turtles to an old pond to kill them, but things are not always as they seem. If you're unlucky you will come across a monster, and here you can try and attack it or run away, and then your character gets an idea. Now this scene didn't always appear at the same point, but you can go and fight monsters by using one of the controls. Another thing that seems to be random are the pictures that you find. There are some weird pictures lying about in different locations, and viewing them often shows different images. There's certainly a lot to explore in this game and it's very well presented, the graphics are great, and the controls work really well. There is music that plays throughout, but this can be turned off if you don't like it. Overall, this is a great game then, that will keep you occupied for a while. Way back in 2019, I picked up a large bundle of Spectrum things from eBay, including the Transform keyboard and various tapes, along with this, the Data 5000 computer case. Sadly, this case did not have the internal separators. The previous owner had obviously stripped them out and just used it to store random things, and I use it for that exact purpose today. Sometime in early 2021, another case came to my attention that did have the separators, and so I grabbed it with a view to rebuilding it, and now it's time to do that. Now that I was ready, I tried to find an advert to see exactly how it was laid out and what it looked like, but I couldn't actually find one. I don't know when this was released, but I'm guessing sometime in 83 or 84, and I don't know how much it costs, but I don't think it could have been cheap because it's a pretty substantial product. Before I began, I thought I'd have to pick which case I was going to use based on condition, However, I discovered that the separators could not be removed. They were glued in place, so that limited me to just one option. The case was in a pretty bad state, especially the internal plastics, and there were cracks and bits broken off, and the main front lip was loose, under which was the remains of hot glue. So I'm not the first person to try and fix this. It was also dirty, and judging by the hairs that were in there, the owner had a cat. So let's make a start. First it needs an initial clean. I used warm water and a bit of kitchen cleaner just to get rid of the grime and then I could have a look and see what was loose and what needed gluing back in place. The two small corrugated bits of plastic on the front left and right parts were not stuck on very well at all and one had fallen off completely. And at this point I thought that was all that needed doing. I first cleaned the old glue away from the plastic areas and then applied some black contact adhesive and hoped it wouldn't melt the plastic. These went in very easily, luckily, and I had to wait for those to dry before I stuck the front lip down. During this process I noticed another bit of plastic had broken off, a small square at the back. This had been stuck down using double-sided tape, which had more or less disintegrated. So a quick clean 
some more contact adhesive and that was back in place as well. On to day two and all the things were dry and it was time for a fuller clean. All the corners, edges and surfaces were cleaned and then the case itself, both inside and out. The plastic was scratched and marked in some places and no amount of cleaning would get rid of this. I did try some rubbing alcohol and that seemed to improve things slightly but not too much. I was never going to get this in perfect mint condition again. Once all that was done it was time to start putting things into it. Although I had no advert to go by, a useful post on the Spectrum Computing forums and a bit of guesswork made it really easy. The Spectrum here. The power supply goes in here. And the ZX printer here. There are two areas that hold tapes, so I got out my Sinclair tapes, along with Horizons, and put them in. And there it is, the final case, complete with contents. And this top area here is I assume where all the cables would go. It does look nice, but I wouldn't use it to carry my Spectrum things in. They would fall out, unless of course there was added padding to hold things in place. Once it was ready I took a few photographs on the red background, just in case I needed them for any future projects. It does look nice, and I'm pleased that I finally restored it, at least the best I could, and made it look like it was back in the 80s. Well, that was time well spent, I think. Let's take a sidestep. It's ages since I've been to a retro event, and we all know why that is. So when I got a chance to go to the arcade club in Bury with Jeff, I couldn't get there fast enough. Split across three floors, the arcade club in Bury caters for a wide range of preferences, from pinball machines, Minecraft and modern consoles, back to the classic arcade machines of the 80s and 90s. The top floor, not only having a bar, is the place to go for the classic machines. Here you can find such things as Tempest, Phoenix, Afterburner, Donkey Kong, Centipede, Asteroids, Burger Time, Scramble, and a whole lot more. And there are a lot of machines there. With all of those arcade cabs on, it was loud, but that gave it a very early arcade feeling, which was great. All machines were on free play, and most machines were easy to get onto. The only one we had trouble with was the Star Wars sit-down cab. This always seemed to be occupied by a child who had no idea what was going on and had no appreciation for the classic machine that they were sat in. Anyway, this was a fantastic day out and I only wish I could have taken more video. I can't wait to get back there. We thought we'd do something different for this next section. So instead of just doing a game review, because I wanted to include Baggers in Space in the Spectrum next section of the Spectrum show, we thought we'd play it. Both Paul and I together. That's right, and for people that are on my Patreon channel will know that we've done this with several other games before, and probably several other games in the future, but this is the first time it's been seen on the main channel. So I've kicked off, and I'm going in with the intro. Oh, the Warhawk um, ship is on the asteroid as well. So, here is Baggers in Space, that's very reminiscent of Jetpack initially. You have to avoid the meteors. 
and uh, build your spaceship. But then it changes in that you have uh, collect TNT and blast holes in the surface like that and head down. Jeff's already down in there, he's beating me to it. I now have some fuel for my rocket ship. So do I. Um, although I'm on a very tricky part of the bit. So yes, the, it's the same idea as jetpack. You have to collect fuel. And However, the, the game map is infinitely bigger. Yeah, it's kind of a cross between Jetpack and Hero, isn't it? It, it is. A lot of people have yeah. said that. Yeah, you've oh, got... Um... Loads and loads of people have said that. Um, <laughs> and they are right. But the main thing you do is get the fuel and get it back to your ship. There's lots of variation in the enemies. I like, I like the way that you get variations in the levels as well. Finished and taken off from the first planet. Me as well. Don't, doesn't everyone know about this? I think one everybody reasons, knows about one it. Of the, one of the reasons we didn't, I mean, programmed by Rusty Pixels, uh, Jim Bagley. It was one of the first games released for the next, and I think one that many, many people have got. Um, you can get a physical version, but you could get a physical version. The actual... Um, Spectrum games, uh, Spectrum Next game scene seems to be ticking along nicely. It does. Mm, people releasing games for it quite all the time. Quite a few nice ones as well as as, as been seen on your little section. Yep. Some are free. Some some you have to purchase. Some you can get physical copies. Some are digital download. There are some. There are actually some really really good games. People are using lots of different um, coding tools as well. Some people are using Basic, Next Basic, which I mean, you can get great games on Next Basic. Some people are using compiled Next Basic. Some people are using ASM. Um, yeah, it's really, really, really good to see. It's nice to think that Basic's good enough on the Next to be able to build some quite good little games. Um, I mean, I I adored Hero when I was young. Hero was one by f yeah, really, really one of my favourite games. I think I think the twenty, the Atari twenty six hundred. Um, it was definitely my favourite game on that platform. So having having this game has been absolutely terrific. I think I'm just going round in circles. I've been to the same three screens about <laughs> six times now. I'll give you a tip. You need to go to some different screens, Paul. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to get to them. Um, I'm, sl I'm slightly concerned I've already been in the screen. That I yeah, I think I'm going around in circles. Right. You definitely need a map, don't you? I'm onto the next screen. There's a wall here, and I've got no dynamite. Oh, I have. I think if you run out of dynamite, if you go back to the top, some more drops. Oh, I've just hit a Spectrum. Oh no! I'm, at least fuel. Spectrum was left undamaged. And I've just died. Baggers has just floated off up the screen. The end. Mortal coil. Yes. So that that's me finished. This feels quite fair, because one of the things I've noticed is whenever, whenever we play games together and you put a little bit of gameplay of me playing, you always seem to show me playing really badly, Paul. Is, no. is that just coincidence? It is just is coincidence. That... You're, you're a much better arcade player than I am, as was seen at the recent visit to the arcade club. Is, that, is this your third planet you're on now? Yeah. There, there, yeah are, which... there are a lot of good contenders for good games, but I mean, yeah. th this is very much in the mould of Jetpack and Looney Jetman and, like you say, a hero, so it's, it's, it's yeah. going to be a winner, isn't yeah. it? When you edit this, you have to leave in me saying Quad Dragon, by yeah, the way, I just know. so people know I've got it right now. <laughs> <laughs> After the comments. <laughs> and I've exploded, and Bagus has turned into an angel and ascended to heaven. Well, that was the end of the series. I'll be back shortly with a whole new one, full of Spectrum goodness. Thanks for watching.